Hurricane Irma has lost a bit of intensity at this hour, but its danger is undiminished. Sustained winds dropped slightly today to 175 miles an hour. The storm is still heading for Florida, and it has left a trail of at least 10 dead and heavy damage in the northern Caribbean. William Brangham begins our coverage. Whole islands lay wrecked today, 24 hours after taking direct hits from Hurricane Irma. Destruction on Barbuda spread as far as the eye could see. The Prime Minister said 95% of the buildings are damaged or simply gone. We just did a flyover and I have to tell you, my heart sunk. And this has been one of the worst days of my life. So I know how you must feel as Barbudans. The entire country has been decimated. I have never seen anything like this before. The storm's record-breaking power also smashed the surrounding islands. Seen from above today, the French Dutch island of St. Martin was in ruins. The Dutch Navy flew in supplies and troops by helicopter because St. Martin's airport and harbor were damaged beyond use. The Dutch Prime Minister said even reaching the battered island was a challenge. There is widespread destruction of infrastructure, of homes and businesses. There is no power, no petrol, no running water. To the west, the hurricane battered St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Social media videos showed one family fighting to keep windows closed as the storm passed over and their home filled with water. I could barely walk in there. Look at this. Puerto Rico was also ravaged and woke this morning to its own devastation. More than one million people had lost power, and authorities said there was no way to know how long the outage would last. A story also circulated of a miraculous flight by a Delta Airlines plane from New York to San Juan. The pilot managed to land in Puerto Rico safely and then quickly take off again with a final load of passengers just before the storm closed in. By late today, Irma roared past the northern coasts of the Dominican Republic and Haiti. It's sweeping over Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas tonight and beginning its run past Cuba. By the weekend, a turn north takes it over Florida's Atlantic coast and north onto Georgia and the Carolinas. Skies were still blue over Turks and Caicos this morning, but people were hurrying to stock up before the storm rolled in. I wanted to make sure that I was very prepared this time, so I've done everything. I'm going to go home and shortly I'm going to be filling up bins of water just in case we don't have access to water in the next couple of days. South Florida is bracing for what could be the worst hurricane it's seen in decades. Shelves were already empty at stores today. Highways were clogged with people heading north, and people waited for flights at Miami's main airport. Governor Rick Scott warned Floridians everywhere to take heed. It's wider than our entire state and could cause major and life-threatening impacts on both coasts, coast to coast. Regardless of which coast you live on, be prepared to evacuate. Preparations were also underway farther north. A mandatory evacuation order was issued today for Savannah, Georgia, and Georgia, as well as North and South Carolina, have all declared states of emergency ahead of Irma's arrival. The damage in its wake could be compounded by yet another storm. Hurricane Jose powered up today to 120 mile an hour winds. It's poised this weekend to hit some of the same islands already hammered by Irma. And the third hurricane, Katia, is still brewing in the Gulf of Mexico. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham. Where Irma actually makes landfall on the U.S. mainland could make all the difference for places like Miami. That's where Ed Rappaport is, closely watching the storm's path. He's acting director of the National Hurricane Center. Ed, first of all, what is the very latest on the direction of the storm? Yeah, at this hour of the hurricane is located about 650 miles off of the Florida Peninsula and unfortunately is moving in that direction and the forecast we have is for the center to continue in that direction and then take a turn to the north very near or over the Florida Peninsula and if that does occur then indeed we will have potentially devastating impacts on the Florida Peninsula and Florida Keys. How strong could it still be at that point? At this point, the hurricane is at the upper level or upper uh, category of five highest winds on our scale. And we think that it'll be either at category five or category four when it comes ashore. The difference isn't going to make, uh, it won't be a big difference in terms of the impacts. It will be potentially devastating. We have um, concerns 
usually for the water, and of course that's the case here with storm surge and rainfall, but this storm is so strong that in fact the winds are also going to be a great risk for property and life from so, Hurricane Irma. So the message from this to residents of, of the entire state of Florida is what? At this point, they need to prepare. For South Florida, all the preparations need to be complete by tomorrow, by Friday, because the initial uh, tropical storm force winds, which are the threshold uh, beyond which we should not be outside, it becomes dangerous, those are going to be arriving Saturday morning, it appears, in South Florida, and then the weather will deteriorate even further from then, with the worst of the, of the um, of other conditions being Saturday night into Sunday. So all preparations need to be complete. There are evacuations um, underway, and we urge everyone to follow the advice of their local emergency management officials. I remember uh, as Harvey was bearing down on Texas and the Gulf Coast and, uh, some days ago, you were saying at that point Harvey was not changing uh, in, its, in its strength and its predictability. How is, how is Irma different in that regard? How much change could we see at this point? Much like Harvey, we don't expect there to be much change in terms of the, the strength of the hurricane, and that's really bad news because it's uh, considerably stronger than Harvey was. This is, again, Category 5 hurricane. And our biggest concern is going to be, in addition to the wind and the potential rainfall, is going to be storm surge. This map shows where, we, where the greatest risk from storm surge is. You could see 5 to 10 feet of surge. That's a rise of water, inundation above ground level, and we'll have waves across the top of that. So this is where we have a storm surge watch in place, which means that there's the potential for life-threatening storm surge within the next 48 hours. So particularly along the coast, and in Florida, that's where most of the lives have been lost, is at the coast due to storm surge. This is the area that needs to be um, most prepared for the water. And then even inland, though, we are going to have risk from that very strong wind. It looks like a lot of square miles. Ed Rappaport uh, working hard on yet another major hurricane. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Regardless of where the eye of Irma strikes, Florida is poised to get hit hard by winds and flooding. Residents throughout the state are bracing for the worst, and our P.J. Tobia is there. P.J., I know you've just arrived. You are on the Atlantic coast of the state. Tell us exactly where you are and what you're looking at. Uh, that's right, Judy. I'm here in Port Canaveral, not too far from Orlando. This port is the second largest cruise ship port in the world. It sees millions of cruise ship passengers a year, and it's been a flurry of activity since we got here a few hours ago. Uh, the cruise ships are coming in from all directions, disgorging passengers, and then taking off for safer waters where the hurricane isn't going to be. Uh, I was actually talking to the director of this port not too long ago. He said that in just the last 48 hours, more than 10 thousand cruise ship customers have had their cruises cut short. Um, while we were speaking, he got a phone call from a Carnival cruise ship that was on its way here and was saying uh, they were rerouting to New Orleans. So a lot of people's travel uh, travel plans being disrupted by this storm. The cruise ship industry brings Florida about $8 billion in revenue each year, so it's a lot of disruption to state revenue. This port, also a major source for natural gas coming into the state and, and also uh, motor fuel. So people are, are worried about price rises in filling their tanks over the coming weeks. So, PJ, I see a little bit of blue sky behind you, so the storm has clearly not hit yet. But how are people who get off these ships uh, who's, who are dropped there uh, when they thought they were going to be traveling, what are they doing? That's actually a big worry. There are no vacant hotel rooms in this area or really anywhere in the state of Florida, according to folks we've spoken to. And just trying to book our own travel in the area was a challenge. Um, and that is why some ships are now being, deport, uh, being diverted from this location to other places in the region that are hopefully not going to be uh, harmed by the storm. The airport also was completely jammed. And, and just for people who live in this area, we saw long lines around gas stations, many gas stations out of fuel entirely. Well, we can't imagine. Uh, P.J. Tobia, who will be reporting for us from there uh, at Port Canaveral on the Atlantic coast. Thank you. Thank you, Judy.
So many streets in Miami Beach were underwater just last month after seven inches of rain. Now the city is one of the places in Florida under a mandatory evacuation order. Residents spent today piling sandbags and battening down before leaving town. I spoke by phone with Miami Beach's Mayor Philip Levine just a short time ago. Mayor Philip Levine, thank you very much for talking with us. Your evacuation orders uh, were effective today. How are people complying? Really good so far. As a matter of fact, when you, when you, I've been all over the city all day and literally you're seeing people leaving. It's quiet. The streets are deserted. And from a town that you can imagine is always packed, now the streets are empty, which is a very good thing. I started urging and encouraging the residents and the visitors to leave Miami Beach literally two to three days ago because we felt we didn't want to wait for an evacuation order. We wanted people to start getting going and get through their plan or, or leave Miami Beach as soon as possible. What are you preparing for? What are you telling people to prepare for? Of course, they're leaving, and so I assume you've got a much smaller population, but what, it, what are you preparing for? Well, listen, we think this is a very powerful storm. This is a historically powerful storm. Uh, it is so aggressive. It's coming our way. Uh, we hope it doesn't. Uh, we are uh, planning for the worst. We're hoping for the best. Uh, we brought in emergency generators, emergency pumps. Uh, we have given out free sand for sandbags to our residents in multiple locations. Uh, we've closed down construction sites, tied down both public and private uh, machinery and things that could potentially become debris. Uh, we're working very close with the county, offering bus service, trolley service, to get folks to shelters across, not on the island, but on the mainland. Uh, so we're doing everything we possibly can uh, preventively and, of course, constantly communicating with our residents and our visitors so they understand what to do and how serious this situation is. And that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you is where are people going and how are you cooperating with other jurisdictions in the area, other cities, the county, and so forth? Very well. i got to tell you, Miami-Dade County, Miami, uh, everyone works very well together. Uh, we've had various crises. Of course, this is something unbelievably serious in nature, uh, and the machine works well. Uh, so people are responding, people are listening. Obviously, there's traffic and gridlock throughout the state. Uh, but I can tell you that on Miami Beach right now, uh, we've done everything in our power uh, to evacuate the city and lock things down for what we expect to be a very powerful, very dangerous storm. Are you going to remain in Miami Beach? 100% absolutely. I'll be bunkered down with the command staff in a hardened location, which the best place for us is the actual major hospital here at Mount Sinai Hospital, and that's why I'll be riding out the storm. And, and as you do prepare in these final hours, what are you most worried about? Well, I'm most worried about any residents that don't believe that this is very serious, that we somehow want to stay here. I know that some of the building, condominium buildings, are turning off electricity, turning off water, uh, and, and literally turning off the air conditioning. And, of course, that's a pretty big incentive for those residents to leave their building and leave Miami Beach. That, of course, is a major concern, coupled with, besides just the wind damage, we're very concerned about tidal surge. We know when a, when a storm like this comes in, uh, we understand how high you can have a storm surge come, and that could be very devastating to the city. Mayor Philip Levine, uh, preparing uh, for this very big storm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cuba is also preparing for Irma's wrath less than a year after parts of the island were hit hard by Hurricane Matthew. For more on the situation there, I spoke a short time ago with Richard Patterson in Havana. He's lived in Cuba for two decades as the representative for CARE, the international aid group. I started by asking about where preparations stand now. We're right now preparing in the sense of um, uh, refreshing our contacts with suppliers of relief items, uh, reviewing the list of, uh, of items that we need to procure uh, to respond to the needs of the population. Well, what exactly do you expect those needs will be? We anticipate that coastal communities are going to be severely affected, uh, heavy rains, strong winds, uh, storm surge will uh, no doubt result in flooding to um, particularly coastal communities and people will have to leave their homes, seek higher ground. The Cuban Civil Defense has evacuation plans uh, in place and are kicking in, um, but then uh, CARES response uh, kicks in when people start returning home. Um, typically we provide uh, uh, hygiene goods, uh, water handling and water purification 
uh, supplies, uh, basic household supplies, because it's likely that people will have lost virtually everything at home. How well equipped is the Cuban government to to handle this? Uh, I mean, just to give folks an, a sense of uh, the state of preparation there. Cuba's civil defense uh, uh, has evacuation plans, um, very effective uh, at their um, uh, evacuating of uh, families, people that are in particularly um, vulnerable situations. Um, so there are centers ready to receive families uh, where there's drinking water, uh, where there's food. And a year ago when Hurricane Matthew hit, there were upwards of 500,000 people that had to be evacuated, and that happened uh, quite smoothly. As I understand it, though, evacuation orders have not yet gone into effect. Just from a human standpoint, how are the Cuban people dealing with this? It's a struggle, uh, for sure, particularly in Guantanamo province, which went through or um, faced Hurricane Matthew less than a year ago. At the same time, um, uh, they have some experience, um, and there are clear uh, um, orientations from uh, the Cuban civil defense in terms of how families need to prepare whether it's protecting their homes, whether it's, uh, if necessary, evacuating, uh, whether it's storing supplies. There are clear um, a guidance available, and it's um, uh, disseminated extensively amongst the, uh, uh, the population that is um, uh, potentially going to uh, be hit by the storm. Well, Richard Patterson uh, with the CARE organization uh, in Cuba, thank you very much, and we wish you the best in dealing with this. Thanks very much, Judy.